Hi there, and welcome to today's webinar, where we're going to be having a look at the General Data Protection Regulation in review. So this really webinar is aimed to look to kind of give more of a, a perspective from uh, you know myself as an actual business owner, as well as actually someone who's working within the kind of the technology arena around management and security, and just really starting to have, ideally help give a, a kind of a, a viewpoint where that might support you in your own kind of thoughts and processes and actually how you start to take approach to GDPR. So just quickly as an agenda uh, point that we're going to run through for today, essentially I'll just give you a quick introduction to who I am and who power on are uh, we'll do really then a, a kind of a, a business review of gdpr so look a little bit at the kind of the key requirements but also you know what would be that kind of viewpoint in terms of trying to cut through some of the jargon and some of the other bits and pieces into that uh, then we're going to take, take a look a little bit at some of the enabling technologies from microsoft at a high level and kind of really focus in then to some practical examples of where you can kind of choose some of the technologies to help address maybe some of the the broader risks um, well, obviously not necessarily comprehensively, but certainly try and do these where actually they may be quick to get started. So ideally support you to de-risk yourself as quickly as possible, whilst you obviously got time to start to look to kind of build on that from an actual more fuller GDPR plan and, and actual um, program. Uh, this will then really be trying to give you a bit of support and guidance as well around where you can get some of the supporting resources available to you. And of course, if there are any questions, then we can certainly kind of do a bit of a quick Q&A at the end of the session as well. So just by way of a quick introduction, my name's Phil Mercer. Uh, I'm the Solutions and Services Director at PowerOn. So I always tend to say that I'm, I'm technical, but not the techie. Uh, I primarily run the, the business aspects of our organization from mainly in terms of how we engage with customers, but also some of the operational side of the business. I've been in the IT industry for about 12 years with really very much a background in helping kind of organizations, both external to PowerOn as my history and, and obviously within PowerOn for the last four years around building the professional services and kind of solution practices within. Uh, I've got a background in consulting for about the last eight years as well uh, with a broad range of kind of customer environments and countries. And really, I tend to say that my specialism is working really in the workplace and kind of data center management solutions. Um, if you want to actually find me, then you can uh, check out my Twitter, though I would say that I am pretty poor <laughs> at the social media side of things. So I probably always should be better, as the marketing manager does tell me consistently. Uh, but equally, they are far better at it than I. So you can also check out our kind of power on uh, at underscore UK for a Twitter handle as well to kind of get regular updates and information that we share. Of course, if you do have any questions, feel free to drop me an email. Uh, my email address is philip.mercer at powerandplatforms.com or certainly check out our website as well as we do try and share, you know, a lot of um, kind of knowledge and information as well uh, with, you know, kind of uh, the industry at, at, at large. A quick introduction to Power On. So essentially, I tend to always say Power On is kind of formed from a collection of industry veterans. Reality is that just basically means a, a bunch of people who have done it for too long and like it too much. Uh, but we do are very much focused as being subject matter experts. So, you know, we don't position ourselves as being experts in everything, but we really do look to, you know, be specialists in the areas that we focus on, such as workplace and data center management, where we've quite literally written the book for some of the Microsoft technology sets that sit within that space. Uh, we do take a bit of a modernized approach as well to delivery. So so, you know, we obviously have consultancy services and capabilities within the business. We also intermix that with a range of our own developed IP, where we ideally look to help customers accelerate how they actually get solutions in place, whether that be for deployments or configurations. And we are very much community focused. You know, uh, a lot of our team uh, do regular blogging as well as we share these regular webinars to really kind of provide knowledge, uh, you know, and so that's kind of at our heart with our, some of our directors being MVPs which is very much around a community support and accolade from Microsoft in terms of being most valuable professionals. And we do very much take an pro approach of being business-led rather than technology. Fundamentally, that means really we're not going to just kind of uh, do technology for technology's sake. It really needs to be aligned into kind of a right fit for your business and the need at hand. So really to move on then in terms of what we're looking at next for this actual session, wanted to kind of take a bit really of a, a business review of GDPR. Now, to be honest with you, that primarily means what do I kind of interpreted when I've been looking at this for our own organization, you know, from a perspective of where the ICO is kind of been positioning this, where we started to see different kind of industry experts and information governance experts start to talk about it. And just really a little bit of a perspective on that. So I ideally help kind of give you some of the information that I've kind of collected as well as some of the kind of the differing viewpoints to some of that information that's, that's kind of there. So if we actually look just, just fundamentally at you know the GDPR purpose and application, 
it's obviously really looking to say that you know we all hold a lot of data in relevance to how we actually engage with our customers, consumers, or into partner side in terms of how we support partners' engagement with that as well. And essentially, this is really looking to build on where the Data Protection Act has been in play for, for many, many years, but really evolve that into the more digital world where obviously a lot of this data is now being able to be kind of compromised or accessed, which potentially exposes significant risk. And this is then saying that essentially it's looking to enhance the rights and the protection for citizens' personal data and really fundamentally kind of put down some pretty specific rulings around how citizen data should be used and equally should be protected. So significantly enhancing um, the rights, but also the regulatory breach and the regulatory reporting requirements on organizations to fit within this, which is why the fairly a substantial change from some of the DPA purposes uh, or some of the DPA requirements from before, where say, say it's out some of the rules, but equally it didn't necessarily have as much of the actual necessarily uh, regulatory side in terms of some of the impacts of that. Um, this does apply to essentially anyone that is handling or processing data in the context of selling goods to EU citizens. So it doesn't really matter if your organization is headquartered in other locations or the data that you are actually reside in is held outside of the EU. Fundamentally, if you're wanting to deal with anyone that sits within an EU citizen, it can be looked to be enforced from the actual go live date of May of next year. Now, where I mentioned that as well in respect of, you know, uh, the difference between the DPA um, or the Data Protection Act and where we're kind of starting to see the GDPR or the General Data Protection Regulation kind of coming in. If you go to the ICO website, they have quite an interesting blog series around myth busting. Um, so I've actually found that really quite useful to just to kind of get a bit of perspective on some of the kind of the news items that you see around massive fines or breach reporting and other things like that. Because actually there's always measures within those different kind of aspects that you hear. So it's not necessarily all 100% black and white and equally it's not always the worst case scenario that may be something that comes through. However, one piece that the ICO is is trying to obviously position to to us as a as a as an industry in terms of wanting to how we deal with this is essentially that GDPR is meant to be an evolution in data protection, not a burdensome revolution. Now, technically speaking, that is that is accurate. If you look at some of the the actual obligations under the Data Protection Act, there is an awful lot of that that has essentially been built on within GDPR. However, the Data Protection Act didn't necessarily have the same levels of enforcement, and certainly it hasn't. It's been very poorly enforced, even where it did have the capability, and hence the regulations on that. Well, that's essentially meant that is, you know, a lot of organisations, although aware of the DPA, don't really necessarily have the systems and processes in play. So essentially, we're now starting to look at this, but due to things like the breach reporting requirements or the um, actual rights of citizens to request access to information that you may hold or how you process information that you may hold, GDR, GDPR does fundamentally present pretty much one extreme to the other, uh, in essence, where really it does start to push you to say, it is now presenting more of an enterprise risk than say Data Protection Act did, although data protection was certainly there to, to look to protect citizens in their in how we use their data. But it wasn't necessarily always practical um, in terms of actually how it started to do enforcement for that. Whereas GDPR certainly does look to be able to give far more um, heavier rights to the ICO to look to go towards enforcement, but also puts far more obligation on the actual businesses and people that are actually processing or handling uh, citizen data in terms of their requirements to report and provide kind of clear and open access to that. What, in, what is important to say, though, is, you know, from ICO's own positioning, don't think that immediately if you if you have, um, you know, challenges that you're going to be, you know, immediately hit with a 20 million fine or a 4% of your revenue, by their own kind of positioning, they are looking to be more measured on the approach. And there are a range of actual kind of uh, results that could happen, whether they be sanctions, which of course are still bad because they can affect your, your brand and awareness, but equally it does then start to go to fine side. Big thing with this is actually thinking about it in terms of really starting to take a proactive approach to it. If you can demonstrate that you've been looking to put measures in play, then you are more likely to get leniency if you do have a challenge within this. Whereas if you have obviously actively acted against or actively not done anything, then it is more likely that you're going to start to see a, a heavier a heavier hand being applied to you as an organization. So less about the little bit of the, uh, the scaremonger in some respects it is there, because I'll, I'll touch on in a minute, you know, where to potentially 
put a mindset to this. Just let's looking at then the primary requirements, you know, can in terms of what kind of makes up GDPR from that kind of function sort of functional side of things so consent is a is a key one within respect to this though actually it's it's also fair to say that actual data processing is not necessarily all about consent there are multiple reasons as to where you why and, and how you may uh, get rights to actually can uh, process a user's data but when we are starting to look to kind of gather marketing lists or use sales lists or how we're actually starting to work with and market to consumers, then essentially requests for consent must be simple to understand. You can't kind of start sticking lots of legalese in there to try and confuse people to accept consent without consent and consent. And really, it's got to be very much clear and requested, you know, when you actually do capture um, a user's data. That also goes into how you potentially need to gain consent if you're engaging with a younger audience, you know, and so if it's a children based or an age side, you also need to look to get parental permissions in respect of actually how you obtain that consent for the use of their data. Equally, this has to be as easy to give as it is to withdraw if they actually are working on a consent based mode in terms of the way that you're handling processing of data. Breach notification. Uh, in the event of a breach, it's pretty commonly seen here that most people think that you must report every breach that happens uh, within respect to GDPR. That's actually not true. Um, so in the event of a breach, it is, it's really the key aspect here is the potential risk. Uh, there are some information in the ICO, and I'll, I've got some guidance at the end of this or some links to some resources which will help you with this. But essentially, the primary piece where you're actually required to report a breach is if, if the actual breach itself does represent you know a likely risk to citizens rights or freedoms and in that circumstance then it does need to be reported within 72 hours to data controllers or certainly within as quick a method as you can based on your you know your approach to breach reporting however technically it is 72 two hours but again going back to that point that actually you know it's really around you showing that you've endeavored to ensure you're doing breach reporting equally if the actual breach is considered to be high risk to individuals, then you also are required to actually notify the individuals that are exposed themselves, as well as the data controllers at hand. Right to access uh, basically gives that citizens have the right to obtain a confirmation of whether you are handling their data and how you're using that, and equally uh, to obtain a free copy of that personal data held by you with the potential requirement to update, change, uh, if, if required to basically ensure that you have accurate uh, information held on, on file for them. Extending that though is also the right to be forgotten. So in a context where you don't necessarily have a legitimate reason, and this is an interesting one around legitimacy, then um, essentially citizens do retain the rights that they can request their data to be erased. So really this is in the context, you know, it's, it's probably of sales is probably the most, uh, um, le, you know, where you don't have a legitimate reason to retain their data because fundamentally you're using that for your benefit rather than necessarily for the citizens. However, there are a number of um, actual other uh, aspects that give you lawfulness for processing of that data. And that can be aspects such as your requirement to be able to need it to actually perform a contract uh, where the data subject is actually part of that or their, their PIA falls within part of that data uh, contract, uh, whether it's for compliance with a legal obligation or, you know, protecting the actual interests of that data subject or another person. And there are a couple of that actually kind of fit within that. And again, the um, some of the resources at the end will just, just help you point you in the direction of where lawfulness of processing conditions can be found. So you can get a, a better view of where that right to be forgotten is. You know, I always tend to say, you know, we've, I've had a few conversations with different authorities and things. You know, it's not like a user can uh, submit a request in to say to a local authority, can uh, you retain, you know, raise all my data where you've got parking tickets? It would be nice, but unfortunately, no, you can't do that. Data portability. Uh, this is really then saying that actually you need to be able to, on request, um, provide a effectively electronic or in a in an open document format so that citizens are able to obtain and, and then reuse that personal data for being able to share across different IT environments as well. So data portability is essentially allowing citizens to obtain copies of their personal data for you in electronic format that can be openly shared. And privacy by design is an interesting one, and certainly for one as we start to look to evolve businesses and our, and our internal systems, then essentially this is bringing in a requirement that you must actually plan at the start of any kind of new system or setup, uh, effectively ensuring that you've looked to provide appropriate technical and procedural measure, measures within that system to be able to support you in complying with GDPR. 
there's a couple of bits and pieces the ICO uh, have provided that can be quite useful for this. Uh, you know, a PIA or basically a privacy impact assessment can be used when you're starting to look at the type of data that you're handling within potentially a new system and what that might mean is your levels of exposure and hence how you can start to plan. But equally, it's important to think about actually how you're engaging then with your potential suppliers. And this is a double fold depending on, you know, from the perspective of what you're looking at this. From an actual um, supplier perspective, you need to ensure that their systems are actually going to assist you with this. Because a lot of the time, technology is very much considered an enabler in these side of things. However, the systems are also going to have to mature for many, many situations to actually enable that flexibility that GDPR needs. And hence, you know, pushing those requirements into your procurement frameworks is also going to be something essential. The flip side of that, of course, is we have to be conscious that actually that's probably going to likely start happening far more. So if we're the suppliers of those systems, we also need to be conscious of that in terms of how we're building that into our own products when we're actually starting to provide that out to our customers. And from a data protection officer side of things, this essentially is saying that if you're a public authority uh, or you're an organization of larger than 250, an individual within the business must be prof professionally qualified and nominated as your data protection officer. Though I'd certainly say that, you know, um, speaking the, from an organization that's not 250 seats as yet, um, would certainly say that it's worth considering at any size, you know, because it's certainly very much... You know, this intrinsically building it in, providing it the airtime that it needs, it really does need that full level of executive and organizational business sponsorship. And so having someone in an appropriate level with the appropriate responsibility is a pretty key thing to ensuring that you're actually taking a proactive stance to how you're dealing with data privacy and data management in the future. So if we take a look at this. You know, I kind of tend to think about this in one or two ways. Um, you can obviously take a view where it's actually this is an impact. And there's no denying that, you know, GDPR is a significant change to most organizations. And hence, it is going to cost time, money and effort to actually start to put this in play. But equally, though, it's also fair to say that actually that, by the nature of what it is, represents opportunity to us all. So if we're looking at an, an impact view, then, of course, there's a couple of things. We are going to now be more restricted on actually how we are leveraging commercial data and how we're using that to essentially drive sales promotions or targets or other bits and pieces. And equally, it is going to have that money spend requirement for us, you know, in, as we run up to May and as we continue going past the actual go live, you know, or enforcement date of GDPR. With, you know, not doing that, essentially bringing the risk of fines or sanctions, you know, depending on your viewpoint, one could be worse than the other in terms of potential brand uh, risk, as well as obviously fairly substantial fine potential, depending on how heavy handed the IC goes, ICO goes in, dependent on what the level of breach uh, risk is that has potentially happened for you. The other side of the thing, though, of course, is the opportunity. So, you know, by embracing this, you know, a lot of organizations have done this for many t for quite a long time already, you know, um, you know, it's been quite regular that actually we'd look to get the ISO, the 27,001s or others to essentially demonstrate to our potential customers and our potential consumers that actually we are a secure business, that we are an organization that kind of looks to take data privacy as a key requirement. And this extends that and reinforces that and really kind of shows that we're taking that extra level of, of detail. So being uh, effectively a good data handler will certainly kind of inspire better brands trust. But equally, though, as well, it actually increases business opportunities. So quite a lot of times procurement will, will note, certainly if you're dealing with public bodies that like to see that you've got certain accreditations, though actually it's not necessarily as, as widely said that you must be ISO accredited or must be necessarily cyber essentials or other bits and pieces. However, obviously, when we start to look to GDPR and the compliance right rules that sit then within public authorities or other businesses of larger scale, it's going to be pretty... Um, it's going to be pretty likely that we're going to start to see far more requirements on procurement frameworks or supply contracts that we actually need to be able to demonstrate that we've got good data practices as an organization. And hence, actually, that also, if we can do that and do that effectively, gives ourselves a competitive advantage potentially in the market and certainly supports us in terms of how we're engaging. And equally, the flip side to that is not only can it support you within the actual procurement frameworks, but essentially, you know, data is the lifeblood of any organization. So if we can improve how we manage our data and how we're actually starting to look at maturing our level of kind of information and, and structure around how we have you know, personal information, then actually it can help us improve, you know, how we target and essentially how we improve the higher data quality for that. 
sometimes uh, I've heard a few as a young and, and Deloitte and other things refer to that as data superiority, which is always an interesting one. But I think, you know, equally, this is where it's starting to think about either treating this like a tax or treating this as an opportunity to your business. Either way it's coming, it just depends on which way you prefer to look at it. I think very much from my side, um, I'd be looking at this very much as an opportunity. And I'd also encourage anyone that's looking to try and get better sponsorship within the organization for this to equally take it, you know, not just on the, the stick, but also on the carrot, essentially, in terms of how you're going to start to encourage your your your, your, your kind of board and actual business uh, owners, essentially, to support you in driving this process through. So let's have a little bit of a look then in regards to enabling technologies from Microsoft. I think one of the things, though, that I'd like to kind of start out with before I go into this, because if you're like me, you've probably heard from every man and his dog, essentially, that we can fix your GDPR problems, insert software name here. There is a, a pretty <laughs> reality statement to say to that, that technology, unfortunately, does not solve all your problems. If we actually take a look at um, preparing for the general data protection regulation, which is a, a resource available on the ICO as well, and we go through there's like a 12 step process, then essentially even with my very simplistic um, overview at the side, you see that you know the vast majority of the primary work to be done it's very much process orientated with a good chunk in there, obviously, of intermixing with how you apply that process through training and user awareness. With technology absolutely potentially being a supporter across all of that, but really where technology is probably going to hold you know, more of a sway in some of these aspects is things like how you're understanding the information you hold. In that digitized world, how do we actually start to do good data audits and also ongoing manage how we start to consume data? How are we actually starting to look towards you know, supporting an individual's rights? So, you know, the right to be forgotten. So essentially, how are we going to make sure that our systems support us to actually erase data is going to probably be a little bit of a, 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 you know, kind of a double sided to this, where actually some systems will actually probably be also mainly your inhibitor in the early days of this. And then where we'll start to see systems kind of actually show competitive advantage, where they enable people to actually address some of these challenges in terms of how they're delivering that. Equally, how we're capturing consent will be a critical one. So giving good audit records and also making sure that we handle that data in an appropriate way and give an easy way for our actual users to interact or our consumers to interact with us. And I think data breaching is going to be certainly one where it's going to have a likely high likelihood of needing to support with technology, essentially in the sense that, you know, getting that visibility, starting to see actually what kind of activity is going on within our environment and understanding does that represent potentially someone doing some malicious, you know, the different kind of toolings that are there for threat detection and behavioral analysis realistically are going to be the only way that you're going to be able to be you know competent at doing data breach analysis and data protection by design you know fundamentally um you're going to have to start to look at how the technology that you're gearing towards supports you in actually giving that flexibility and also those data management capabilities as we start to implement new systems or evolve the systems that we have but as i say it's very key to say this is not a technology problem this is very much something that needs to be addressed at an organizational level, and hence it does need the buy-in from multiple departments, and it's not just a, I'm going to give it to IT and let them deal with it. It is very much something that we need to look at organizationally and start to see around how we can use technology to enable some of the process and some of the procedural developments that we're going to need to put in place to address this. Also, one thing probably to be say, say is pretty critical. Um, essentially, there can be a little bit of a mixed message sometimes uh, when we start to look at some of the Microsoft elements as well. Uh, Microsoft, I would say, should give a applaud in some respects because they are very, very proactive in this stance. So they are probably one of the most proactive vendors that we've seen within supporting users. And there's a message that goes out very much, and it's true, that Microsoft technology our position has been GDPR compliant. And that is true, or will be true, for Microsoft, not for you necessarily. So by being on the Microsoft Cloud Services, that does not automatically make you GDPR compliant. As you've seen within some of those 12 steps, or you certainly, as you can refer to afterwards, there are many, many different parts that are more procedural and process orientated. So actually it's more around how you handle that data and how you have access to that data. So actually just putting the data into a cloud-based service won't fundamentally make you compliant. However, it is very true to say that by having it in that kind of cloud-enabled world, 
it does seriously help because obviously now your data is more digitized and now your data has been put into an arena where actually you've got a lot of different kind of supporting tools that sit around a cloud model then actually it gives you a lot of um, capability to start to understand that data better start to mark and classify that data better and leverage kind of actually group shared experiences from some of the different kind of models that exist where it's kind of the you know kind of a, a collective set of data pool that you can kind of take information from and, and make actionable decisions. I'll explain that a little bit better when we go into uh, some of the practical examples of how some of these toolings actually start to give you information and insight. But you know, it is key to say that moving into cloud doesn't automatically make you compliant, but it does certainly help a lot. At a very high level then, the kind of the Microsoft has a range of tools and technologies. I, I'm not going to go into every single one of this because I think I'd probably be here for the next hour or so or more <laughs> if I was going to do that. However, it's just to kind of give you a bit of a you know a high level kind of view that essentially when we start to look at things like Azure and Windows Server, Microsoft are really starting to bring in a lot of capability to you to be able to do monitor as well as kind of do building you know security right into the services at the core, uh, as well as actually starting to kind of give you you know some pretty rich insights into what what people are doing within that environment and importantly something that refers to as just enough or just in time we're essentially trying to move, remove as many privileged identities as possible so that actually if someone needs to have say an administrational access they only get it when they need it and they only get it for as long as they need it and that really does start to help you limit some of your exposure you know just in case someone does get compromised actually those those potential malicious hackers don't have access to a privileged identity straight out of the bat. When we look at aspects such as, say, uh, Dynamics 365, you know, if you are looking to position into that service or you are uh, leveraging alternative services, it's very strong in terms of actually starting to give you some very granular controls. So we look at role-based security for individuals or records. If you're looking at, say, a contact or even down to the individual field uh, for certain data. Uh, and all data is also encrypted. The reason why things like the record-based or field-based security is also critical is, is, as we mentioned, there are actually multiple um, lawful rights for how you process data. So because a lot of the time our systems, uh, you know, our CRM systems, whether it's Microsoft or another, will potentially be used by multiple different departments, but actually the contact records can be actually um, the same contact record, but just accessed from different ways. Then actually one of the key things within this is starting to think around um, how we're saying that actually if a, if a consumer wants to have the right to be forgotten, in the context of our sales and marketing operations, that right is legitimate. But actually, there may be certain aspects within our legal sections for compliance that actually where it's not. So essentially, we need to be able to give that user a, a level of rights where we can not allow sales and marketing to have continued access, but we can allow our legal department to have continued access. And that's where things like field-based security or fairly granular levels of protection really are going to be useful as we start to look to move towards implementing more requirements around this. Office 365 has some really great capabilities, and I'll show you a little bit around that, but that's really around data cataloging and also really starting to do protection around more modern kind of security threats. Um, so essentially, that really big challenge within GDPR is how do we even know what data we have, where we have it, and what type of information is contained within there? So how do we measure and manage our risk? Office 365, if your data is held within the, the exchange or the SharePoint side, there are some great tools to be able to support you with that. Equally, when we start to look to then towards Windows 10, it's also around how we start to build in more inherent security at the device level. So where we are having different users access into services. So aspects such as like device guard and credential guard are really nice. They do require some more modern hardware. So it is it is being conscious of what kind of your, your fleet is like, but essentially it's starting to say things like protecting the actual user's credentials. Again, to say if that user gets compromised, that hacker isn't just gonna immediately be able to actually get all of their credentials and start to go around accessing the different systems and say device card can actually protect you to say if someone actually opens a file that contains malicious code which can be very common in things of phishing attacks and other bits and pieces device card can help protect against basically disallowing any malicious code to be running on that device and we then go into the kind of the enterprise mobility and security and for me this is one of probably the 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 great 
potential starting points for most organizations, uh, whereas the others have differing levels, um, depending on what your level of access and use of Microsoft technologies are today. But enterprise mobility, you know, kind of really contains around both the identity and access controls, which will be critical in terms of doing data security, as well as also bringing in what I tend to refer to a lot of the time as, as kind of protection at source. So we see the identity and access in things like you know, Azure, privileged, Azure Active Directory and privileged access management, going into some of the Intune capabilities. And really then that protection at source with aspects such as the Azure information protection as well. So the ability to essentially encrypt and put policy controls around how people interact and use your documents or use the data contained within your environment. So a lot of different moving parts within the Microsoft suite as there always are, and lots of different kind of bundles and other bits and pieces you can buy. If you want to get a little bit more information on each of these, as I say, there's going to be some resources at the end of the session. But, you know, do check out the Microsoft.com GDPR Resource Center. There's some really good information on there. If we actually take a look, though, around where are Microsoft really taking a more of a strategic approach, uh, which actually is going to be adding a lot of weight and a lot of value uh, in terms of how organizations engage. And this comes from what they refer to as their intelligent security graph. Essentially, what this is, is really around Microsoft doing what I refer to as calling the cloud sourcing of information. So essentially, this looks to say that actually Microsoft has a wide range of consumer tools on the market today, uh, as well as obviously a wide range of co um, actual corporate and business toolings that are used on the market today. And really, they're looking to kind of pull um, a lot of the actual telemetry and the information that are captured within those toolings within you know compliance with privacy uh, in mind of course but essentially allowing them to collect a large set of data that can be used to start to actually feed information in so essentially those range of products with millions and bil millions of users and kind of billions of different transactions on a, on, a, on a regular basis is is collected microsoft then processes and normalizes that data within what's referred to as that graph um, or the intelligent security graph and then they apply a range of machine learning or analytics services to that. So combinations of machine learning as well as doing you know, detonation if it's actually malicious file types and starting to look at you know, different behavioral sides they're seeing commonalities for um, around the different kind of uh, toolings that's been used. Uh, this starts to then actually allow them to um, surface those findings to essentially help fuel future and new discoveries. So the actual API for the for the uh, security graph is two-way, so you can both feed information in and also pull information out. But importantly, those actual um, that information or that analytics is fed back into their product sets. So both you can interact with it just generally, but also all of their products interact with it. So if we're looking at things like Azure Active Directory for say your users. So you've got your standard user credit, your standard user identity within that. This will start to look at, are they actually seeing potentially that user credential being available on a darknet or a botnet? So we're starting to say, well, actually that user credential is compromised. We need to do something about that. You need, or you need to do something about that and protect that. If it's the advanced threat protection where they've actually seen that that file type that's just been opened on that user's device or in that user's email, actually represents a known threat because it has malicious code in it, we're going to look to proactively warn you against that and support you to actually do something about that. And again, that is consistent essentially across all those products. And they intermix that as well around not just necessarily the machine and the technology learnings, but also within their kind of cyber security teams where they're feeding that human intelligence back into this as well. All that data then is essentially shared between the different products, you know, and then fed back into the service as well. So they're continually learning and continually improving as well. So this approach is essentially meaning that Microsoft is able to support its users by both giving them toolings that help them understand their own environment in a very strong way, but equally allows you to pull a lot of information around other shared experiences globally and Microsoft's own experience to really start to look at how we can tackle some of the kind of the more modern attacker threats and more modern attacker security aspects. And very much again, this is where the cybersecurity team will kind of help feed back into that as well to improve those analytics. We can, of course, talk about all these, you know, lovely and fancy technology sets. But, you know, one thing that's probably um, you know, a little bit glib sometimes, but I, I tend to like to just show this to users, is obviously we can never forget about, you know, what is a, a natural flaw to any security measures that we put in place, which is, of course, our users. Of course, if that would play, the uh, the demo gremlins seem to uh, not be liking me today. Um, 
<laughs> if no one's seen this before, essentially this is a, a only a 10 second piece. It was actually from a Jimmy Kimmel live session where essentially it shows just how quickly through only a few basic questions to someone on the street can you get a user's password. One of the things I actually quite liked um, as well, which was a, a little bit of a story, was um, Microsoft have a red and a blue team, if you've ever heard that terminology, but essentially the red team is the attackers, the blue team is the protectors. The red team is allowed to essentially do anything that is considered uh, legal, but uh, to actually see if they can gain access. So one of the things they did uh, was essentially got a load of their pop-up banners and put them in the, uh, the food canteen of one of the Microsoft offices over in Seattle uh, and essentially said, share your passwords, you know, win an Xbox. We're test testing password security strength. And uh, I think you'd probably be uh, unfortunately uh, amazed by uh, just how many people did that. Of course, Microsoft have a whole process that they call role guide. So within the next you know 24 hours, essentially new training came out Make sure you don't share your password at any point. But I think the fundamental point here is, you know, as humans and everything, we are naturally trusting. And social engineering is always one of those ones where, you know, is a is a is one of the easier ways that attackers can start to actually penetrate advanced security as well. So really the point with this being is that when we're starting to layer in new security options, we do also want to think about how do we make this more natural to both ease a user's engagement with that so they don't work against the system, but equally, how do we make it so that we account for where you know users will naturally make mistakes? And that's where you know I like to think the enterprise mobility and security side actually has a, a nice range of technologies within that. Uh, that actually um, is something that, from a point of view of setting up and actually enabling for your business, is relatively speaking quite quick. However, it gives you a pretty broad and comprehensive set of protection. So if we're looking at trying to say manage our risk as staged as possible, this is something you can actually get on with quite quickly. And whilst you're actually putting the larger piece of work in around looking at your procedures and processes. So essentially, it really kind of comprises of three main aspects, thinking about how we grant and restrict access to data thinking around how we protect that data, whether it's on-premise or in the cloud, and also looking around how we detect data breaches before they potentially cause damage. So we look at things like Azure Active Directory. Uh, essentially, you know, there is uh, effectively the ability to then start to apply what is called conditional access. And this is really essentially how are we leveraging or controlling how our users gain access to information based on a few different criteria, whether that be location, the application they're accessing from, the risk in terms of what is presented by that, or actually the device as well. So there's a number of metrics that we can apply. We extend that kind of access as well through different ways around how we put data controls around the access model. So we're leveraging Intune, say, then you know we can either do that at a device or even an application level. So we can put application management. So essentially we can have confidence that the data that has been accessed via that app is secure within the application even if necessarily the device that they're accessing it from is not necessarily managed. But again, we can apply policies around how that can be secured and controlled. One of the ones that you know certainly would see as, as a really critical one and uh, a very um, strong capability to actually be able to put in quite quickly is as well as your information protection. This gives us an ability to really kind of classify, label and protect and also audit essentially the data that exists um, within our environment. So essentially then we can get, you know, kind of digital signed or digitally labeled documents and put policies down again that allows us to say, well, actually, we want to have a common standard that all documentation is, is at least a base level of our security. And depending on where that document has originated from, we can also put extra levels of security and protection against it. As well as, of course, giving our users the ability to say, I want to set a higher level of classification on this or even reduce the classification, which potentially is a risk as well. Um, but set the higher level of classification on there to essentially say that, actually, I know I'm working with sensitive data. Let me protect that. Some of the more advanced capabilities of Azure Information Protection, if you have access to the, uh, the higher licensing models, do also actually allow you to then do automatic tagging, which actually can make the practical side of using that far easier. Or obviously, it's really thinking about how you're going to be training your users to make sure they do work to the policies and the procedures that you've set up. Extending that to the more of the threat detection sides, then what we have is essentially things like either the advanced threat analytics, which looks more around how our users are behaving within our environment, so the internal, the internal kind of access uh, requests or access permissions, as well as then starting to look at, say, Microsoft Cloud App Security as well, which starts to give us insights and visibility around how different applications are being used. So. For me, that will probably be in most of the talking, but let me actually show you a few different bits and pieces in respect of that. So 
I'm just logged in here to actually my uh, Azure portal where I can start to do a lot of the different management side of things. Now, we actually leverage uh, privileged identity management as well. So I've already gone through and I've essentially uh, gone through a multi-stage process to give myself administrational privileges as well. But you can see that you've got a range of different roles and this goes back to that just in time or just enough, where essentially as a standard, I'm just a normal user. But in this context, to support me with a range of different things, I'm just going to quickly show, I've elevated myself to global administrator. So if I actually then take a few, a few quick looks at a few different bits and pieces. So conditional access, and this will be a bit of a whistle stop tour um, rather than going into any deep, deep demo sites. Conditional access is a very powerful piece that enables us to start to look at how do we leverage users or how do we allow users access into our different systems. So we can create a range of policies as mentioned, those policies work on a few different uh, different requirements. So whether it be around who that user is, where they're accessing from, the actual type of application or the risk profile to that, and equally the device that's been accessed. So in this context, we've essentially, we can either do all users, select users and groups and work on the different ways that that's been worked through. Uh, we can start to look at the different cloud apps that we're actually wanting to apply this to, whether it's all apps, selected apps, we can include and exclude. Uh, and we start to look at the different conditions that we can apply for this as well. You know, whether there's being considered the actual sign-in risk based on the location, the type uh, is considered high, medium, low. We can also set policies there. Uh, we can see what the different device types that are being accessed from, whether it be Android, iOS, Windows, full device or not, uh, as well as actually starting to look at how that's bringing in things like Mac OS support for different customers. Locations can start to say, well, actually, we can set IP ranges, uh, either trusted or untrusted, and start to also set where we're actually accepting different accesses from. And it isn't necessarily just accepting, but also the different control mechanisms. So we can say, well, actually, for any IP that we trust, we're happy to allow you to come through. For an IP that we don't trust, then we want to put an actual access control down. And again, this is then allowing you to say, well, also what type of kind of application or access policies are we going to set this to? So whether it be browser-based, whether it be a mobile app or a desktop client type of app that's being used to access that data. And then the access controls start to look at saying, well, do we want to block access or do we want to grant access? But because they're from, say, an untrusted location, we're going to require a multi-factor authentication or we're going to require the device to be marked as, say, compliant with, say, certain patching or, or different bits and pieces as well with respect to that. And then equally, we can start to also bring in some of the newer capabilities that's coming through, but we you know, won't dive into this now, where we can actually start to do limited experiences dependent on whether they've not hit certain criteria. You can make as many policies uh, to this as well, and you can apply those in different ways to build yourself more of a security framework for that. But essentially, the, the kind of the conditional access is giving us a pretty powerful way where we can start to put down conditions and access policies to control how users are able to gain access to our corporate data. If we start to look at, say, then uh, Intune uh, for some of the different pieces, then interestingly, I'm probably just going to take a quick look at, say, the mobile application management side, because again, this could be relatively quick to set up, but say a very common one that we will look to share out is, say, access to email or access to, say, our corporate outlook. One of the things you can do with this is essentially do what's referred to as MAM or mobile application management without enrollment, which means that you can protect the application, but without the need for the users to enroll that device into full management. Benefits there are if you want to still keep, you know, relatively speaking, open access, but you want to have it controlled, then you know, in scenarios such as, say, bring your own device or users using their personal device, or if you've got a lot of partners where you're interacting with teams and you want to be able to say, well, actually, I want them to have access to certain data, but they're not under my corporate control, or even they may be enrolled in a different MDM or mobile device management solution. So you can essentially create different app policies that you can apply down. The, you know, let's just kind of have a quick basic look at a bit of a demo policy here. Uh, but essentially, you can start to apply a range of different bits and pieces, give your actual policy a name, and then you can target it at different groups or users, essentially, of how you want to be able to kind of put that through. Once you've sent that in terms of who you want to be able to kind of put this policy around, then what we can start to do is look at doing targeted apps. The range of what referred to as enlightened apps 
coming in from Microsoft here. So essentially these are already pre-configured or you can add more apps or even line of business apps where essentially you need to be able to work through in terms of having the right, uh, the right contact. But you can essentially extend this once you've put those um, wrappers around additional applications that you may be looking to use. But essentially what we tend to see anyway is that actually the most common piece here is starting to say we want to put this around Outlook and then, you know, starting to see certainly, say, if you're a SharePoint user, you may want to be able to give the SharePoint access out as well, or maybe OneDrive. But essentially, you can very quickly give a fairly good access into your environment, but in a very controlled manner. And then we can start to set policies down to this as well. So the types of policies that we can do is really, as you would probably expect, it's starting to think around, do we want to allow the app to transfer data to other apps? Do we want to allow it to receive data from other apps? You know, do we want to allow it to restrict, say, cut, copy, paste type activities? And do we want to ensure that the actual app data is always encrypted? Disabling contact sync is actually a pretty interesting one. Because if you think about it as well from GDPR compliance, if you have your contacts within, say, your CRM or even in your Outlook, you sync that to your actual device. And then that device syncs the contact to it locally but the local device is not necessarily protected, it could start sharing out personally identifiable information with a range of different applications. So actually it is something fairly important to consider in terms of actually how you manage access to that. So conscious of time, I'm just gonna jump into also a little bit around information protection, just as a bit of a final whistle stop. So Azure Information Protection, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier in the session, is essentially allowing you to layer on digital signing or digital protection and encryption of, of different document formats. The Information Protection from the Azure side expands this out to a wide range of document types. But equally, the nice piece around this is if you're familiar with putting in these types of technologies, a lot of the time the challenging piece can be how you actually share externally. Um, and whereas Azure Information Protection certainly simplifies that quite significantly because it leverages the Microsoft Azure services to actually do that external sharing authentication. So in essence, those external people you may share it to would need a Microsoft Live ID, which they can sign up quite quickly, or if they're an Office 365 user, they'll already have it. But equally, Microsoft is extending this one out now um, to different toolings as well around starting to look to how can we use consumer type authentication. So leveraging, say, your Facebook or your LinkedIn or your different credential there to manage that. I do seem to be having a few demo challenges today. I'm not sure why this is not loading. What I'll probably have to do for the session, I'll, I'll share with you post this, um, maybe a few extra videos just to give you a, a little bit of an insight into the Azure information protection side. But if we actually look um, then quickly into the O365, there's a couple of key pieces within this. One of the really strong pieces of security compliance. I really personally like the, the data loss prevention side. So we go back to that idea around cataloging data. So if you are an O365 user or intending to become an O365 user, then essentially you can use data loss prevention so you can create policies. Again, going back to that idea that Microsoft has been able to kind of do more online or digital support because you're using a cloud service, this really comes in in terms of how it supports you to detect the type of data. So you can essentially start to look at different kind of types of data, whether it be custom, privacy, medical, financial, but equally you can then start to structure it. So if we were looking at the UK, I want to know all data that exists within my 0365 that's PCI um, DSS essentially or UK financial data or from a privacy side I want to see things that are potentially subject to the UK Data Protection Act or are personally identifiable information. So it gives you a really strong way of being able to actually very quickly catalog and understand the data that you hold within the actual Microsoft Cloud services. So it does significantly help in that kind of data catalog and the data understanding perspective. So I'll just close that one down for a moment. Then Essentially, I was going to jump in quickly to cloud app discovery. However, what I'll probably do is this is a nice, uh, interesting one, but again, I'll probably share a video just because of the interest of time uh, to be able to actually give you a bit of insights into how this works. But this is really extending a lot of that intelligence and information and understanding of what's going on within your environment into maybe how they're using the cloud services as well. So a very powerful tool. It is within the advanced licensing model, though, just to be aware of. Uh, but certainly, if you're a heavy user of cloud applications, it's a very good tool to have. So if I just jump back then quickly into the actual, just finalize out the PowerPoint. So bear me, sorry. 
then essentially just as a quick quick summary to the sessions as well there are a range of resources to help support you on getting guidance on on gdpr obviously there's a wide range of information many from many many partners and many many vendors but the ico actually has some really quite useful information and great resources so there's some good toolkits around helping you to do self assessments and starting to really plan your structure and procedures to that and also their myth busting actual series of blogs is actually really quite useful and quite informative to those new to gdpr though as i say i take some of their myth bustings with a bit of a pinch of salt uh, microsoft has also equally provided some very strong resources so the primary content sites is actually going to be a nice summary and collection of all the different data so good videos good information and again more assessment tools and white papers that you can use equally microsoft has a range of support programs so through partners like yourself and elite partner sites then essentially um, you are able to potentially if you're interested look to maybe look at getting some support like proof of concepts or potentially some workshops um, if you are interested in that, of course, feel free to reach out to ourselves, happily talk to you around that if you would like. Uh, but certainly there are a range of resources that you can potentially leverage from Microsoft if you are interested in leveraging their technologies, of course, in the process of meeting your GDPR compliance. As a final quick summary, you know, really what I would say is a first priority needs to be able to establish internal sponsorship and align resource within your organization. You've got to get your department and your board to understand what actually GDPR is and how that's going to mean that you're going to need to develop a project to drive your information governance, your procedures, your systems and fundamentally training for across the business to look towards working to meeting that compliance. Because GDPR is new and there are also things that are still open in some respects and of course as it's a level of legal regulatory side there's also open to uh, interpretation. What I would certainly say in its recommendation as well is to give yourself a good head start is start to look to ensure that you're kind of hitting current best practices within the industry. So things like the cyber essentials is a good starting point as it's a, an easier entry point and a relatively low cost to get accredited or going down more of the industry standard kind of 27,001 from information security as well. It'll give you a great platform to build on when you're starting to go through your fuller GDPR project. But what I would say as well is, in essence, the key aspects of this is how you're engaging with data in some regards in general, but equally your probably higher risk exposure is where you're starting to have that within your sales and marketing functions. And so start to look to focus in terms of that balance of risk to where you actually have the potential higher risk for being in breach of GDPR and then working through over time your organization, as there will be a fairly substantial amount of work and May will come around far quicker than uh, we would all like, most likely. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen. I do appreciate it. I ran a little bit over there. Um, but of course, if you do have any questions or anything else, then feel free to reach out to us. We'd be more than happy to assist uh, and fill in any of the blanks that I may have left within the session today. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much for listening. And I hope you found today's content useful.